OK. OK. Donc, euh, bonjour à vous. Euh, bienvenue à Séminaire IQ. Donc, euh, puisque celui-ci va être en anglais, je vais passer à l'instant en anglais aussi. OK, bon séminaire. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this IQ seminar, uh, which is going to be given by Zachary Vernon, head of hardware at Xanadu. Um, Xanadu's mission is to build quantum computers that are useful and available to everyone everywhere. And uh, they are doing this using a photonic hardware. Uh, more, more precisely, silicon quantum photonic chips that power room temperature and scalable uh, quantum computing. And this is what our guest today will tell us more about. So thank you for being with us this morning, Zach, and uh, the floor is yours. Well, thanks very much, Carl, and uh, bonjour. Good morning, everyone. Thanks very much for, for joining, and thanks to the organizers and Carl for, uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak and tell you a bit about what we're doing here in Toronto, uh, not too far away from, uh, from Sherbrooke. Um, by the way, with uh, uh, an institution I have a lot of respect for, many colleagues of mine have been there, visited there, a good friend of mine did a postdoc there, so it's great to uh, great to speak to you all. And uh, I think uh, it's a fairly, you know, not too big a group, so hopefully we have, uh, you know, time and, and bandwidth for lots of questions and I'm happy to stay on after and, and discuss. Uh, let me share my screen and Carl, if you could just give me another confirmation that it's working. How's that? Yeah, looks good. Okay, let me just go to... I don't know, my sidebar is showing up this time for some reason, but ah, there we go. Oh, it is okay. All right. Great. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so the title of my talk is near term photonic quantum computing on the cloud. Um, I'm going to talk about a few different things. Um, so let me, let me break that down before I launch into it. Uh, let me start by giving you a bit of background information about Xanadu, about our company. Um, it's, I guess, kind of a new institution where we're maybe just four years old actually uh, now. Um, maybe sort of three years when things really got uh, got started in earnest and you know we got funded. Um, but we're you know more more than being a new institution, we're kind of a new type of institution, right? This uh, kind of living in the area of the quantum era of the quantum startup. Um, we're now not just large companies and, and academic institutions, but small sort of scrappy upstarts like us are are, uh, are managing to take a stab at the grand challenge of building a quantum computer. Um, so I'll tell you about uh, about who we are as a company. Um, and then our thesis, uh, point two here, is the case for photonics. I'll tell you about why we think that maybe what, what some might have previously considered or maybe still do consider an underdog approach that in photonics um, is, is worthwhile to pursue for quantum computing. Try to see, uh, you know, try to get you to see through our lens of why we think um, photonics has so much to offer for quantum computing, technologically and strategically. Uh, then I'll tell you about our first product, our actual first quantum computing product, which is um, a Gaussian boson sampler which is uh, available on the cloud. I think actually it's the world's first photonic quantum computer that has been made uh, cloud accessible. Uh, and so I'll tell you a bit about that. That actually just recently launched. We just came out of, uh, out of sort of stealth with that and, and had a press release. And there've been some, so a bit of media attention around that too. So I'll give you some more, uh, some more detail if, if anyone's noticed that. And then I'll talk about what applications we think fit into that architecture of, of Gaussian boson sampling. I think a lot of people uh, may be more familiar with sort of traditional boson sampling. So I'm going to tell you about what's different about Gaussian boson sampling and, and especially what impact that has on the kind of applications you might hope to uh, eventually or even now run, run on the system. Um, then I'll shift gears uh, since there's more time than maybe a typical sort of 20 minute slot here. Um, uh, for those who are interested in the technology, the really low level stuff, the chips, um, certainly for those with a photonic background, as opposed to say uh, quantum computing, more theory background, I'll, I'll spend the last portion of my, uh, of my, of my talk uh, discussing nanophotonic squeeze light sources, which is uh, one of the major sort of technological hardware advancements that we've had to make in order to, uh, to bring the system uh, to sort of, you know, full fruition as a, as a cloud accessible product. So for those interested in the photonic technology, that should, uh, that should be lots of, uh, lots of fertile ground for discussion. Okay, let me launch in. So about Xanadu, um, we're a company of about 60 people. Uh, we're a startup uh, located in downtown Toronto where we have our offices and our labs um, on the nice upper floor of a downtown building. It's a very nice place to work. Um, the 60 people are you know, primarily physicists, engineers, computer scientists, software developers, the usual cast and crew that you would uh, expect to um, you know, be at a quantum computing company with certainly an emphasis on, phot on photonics, but by no means are we only photonics people, people from all sorts of backgrounds. Um, in terms of their academic uh, disciplines are, are, have joined us. Uh, we've kind of divided the company into a few different sub -like teams. Um, of course, we've got management, our, our founder is Christian Wheatbrook, um, and then there's the hardware team led by me, software led by Nathan Kalora, and that's really software and algorithms. They work on um, a lot of algorithm development as well that is uh, in particularly targeted at, at photonic, uh, sort of photonic systems and photonic algorithms. Uh, and then the architecture team, they work on the architecture and uh, also strategies for how to optimize encodings and in photonic systems. And then we have a product side headed by, by Raf, um, 
who works on our kind of cloud products and other products. Um, so we're very lucky to uh, to have this great team. It's it's uh, uh, it's quite a pleasure to work there. Uh, we are funded uh, primarily by venture capital, um, some government as well, but mostly venture capital. Um, and to date, we've raised about $45 million, uh, which has given a, a substantial runway to sort of get started, right? Of course, I think the grand challenge of building a universal fault tolerant quantum computer is, is probably an order of magnitude larger than that in, in, uh, in what it will require, or half an order of magnitude, depending on who you ask. But uh, in terms of launching near-term products, I think this has been given us a, a, wonderful, a wonderful opportunity to do so. So um, to situate ourselves within the community, a bit better. Um, the community being academic research labs building quantum hardware and uh, small companies, you know, Rigetti, INQ, sort of other startups, and also the big companies, IBM and Google and so on, Microsoft working on quantum computing hardware. I'd like to sort of uh, contrast and compare where our path uh, leads and where our path, uh, sort of the landmarks on our path uh, as, as we progress on our technology. Um, I'm going to talk to you mostly about this sort of NISC era devices, this Gaussian boson sampler on the cloud today. That's the that's the our first product, um, and that's sort of a non-universal quantum computer, right? It's a programmable system where you have independent quantum systems that you can program and and run measurements and experiments on. Um, so it's a type of quantum computer. It's not a universal one, certainly not a fault tolerant one. Um, so I will, uh, you know, I don't want you to walk away with the wrong impression that that's sort of all we're working on. We are very much laser focused on getting toward the holy grail for the whole community, which I think is universal, then fault tolerant. I, I kind of use those interchangeably. So universal sort of indefinite computation. So fault tolerant quantum computing in the qubit model. Um, but our path to get there is very different than the other approaches. The other approaches being, uh, in terms of hardware, the superconducting approach, trapped ion, even topological qubit um, uh, spins, what have you. Uh, and that's because we're using photonic modes and we're using the entire photonic mode. So not only are we sort of different in that we're using photonics, which is already something of, a, of an outlier compared to you know, the other dominant approaches, but within photonics, we're using a very different encoding. We are taking advantage of the full Hilbert space of our, of our photonic modes, of our harmonic oscillators, right, which have infinitely many levels. We're not dealing strictly at the beginning with, with two-level systems. Right? We're, we're dealing with uh, you know, what you might call Q modes in the continuous variable model, where you're talking about a full quantized uh, simple harmonic, uh, uh, quantum simple harmonic oscillator mode. And that allows us, um, before we get to sort of, you know, the holy grail of universal fault tolerant qubit based quantum computing, it allows us to access a bunch of unique problems that cannot be simulated or, or studied using those other approaches. So this sort of these, these paths converge. Eventually, we will be encoding qubits, fault tolerant qubits in our uh, in these in these harmonic oscillator modes. But until we get there, uh, we are not really taking the same path, the kind of uh, NISC applications that and that we can architectures that we can access are not on the same road so we have different landmarks along the same way to the same destination and i'll be talking to you primarily about the first one of gaussian boson sampling and what applications fit in there um, and uh, and i think the point to walk away from is uh, to walk away from this and take away from this is uh, that that you know that set of applications that fits into that architecture simply is not accessible on ibm's machine even even the ibm machine that they're talking about they're having in a few years with a thousand qubits now or something like that which will be extremely exciting um, because that's still a qubit based sort of sub fault tolerant model. Um, you cannot simulate Gaussian boson sampling with it. So it's sort of a, uh, an interesting, uh, interesting new fertile ground for, for new, new algorithms and new applications that haven't really been studied in the traditional model um, where, you know, there are lots of other candidates, for example, VQE, QAOA being the probably most likely example of, of near term uh, NISC problems to be addressed. So, um, you know, there's lots of different approaches, as I've mentioned. Uh, why do we argue for photonics? Um, I think some of these points that I've put up here may be familiar. Um, some of them maybe are, are, are a little bit unique to our perspective. Um, so we kind of like to split the advantages, our thesis for why photonics is, is worthwhile, uh, into kind of three tiles, accessibility, scalability, versatility. Um, to expand upon accessibility, uh, one of the top level ones is, in principle, photonics can give you room temperature um, quantum computation. Um, now, those who know photonics ought or know uh, full well that uh, it's not really the situation right now. We do rely on cryogenics for our detectors, right? Right now, to get um, to get you know access to sort of quantum problems, you need single photon counters or photon counters in general, maybe photon number resolving detectors, which I'll tell you about today. Um, but those do require cryogenics right now. Um, there are room temperatures, right? Temperature detectors like APD, silicon APDs work at different wavelengths and so on. So we still do use cryogenics. Um, but in principle, 
Uh, photonics, I think, is the only approach that can give you room temperature computation. Uh, and that's because we're using excitations, uh, photons, which have an energy which is way, way beyond a single, ex ex you know, single photon energy being way beyond um, sort of what's thermally populated at room temperature. Whereas, you know, that's not the case for the microwave ex uh, band ex excitations used in the super technique approach. Same for trapped ions, although, you know, they don't require a cryostat. The ions themselves do have to be in a vacuum chamber. They do have to be, you know, very, very cold. Um, so that whereas our actual, you know, information carriers can be, uh, you know, at, uh, at room temperature, which gives you a very, very long term path to, I would say, a wide, more widespread deployment of where quantum computers can be relevant in space, for example, on edge computing as opposed to in, in just sort of cloud mainframes. But in the near term, we will be, you know, cloud mainframes. Um, compatibility with existing optical infrastructure, um, you know, that that kind of is related to the versatility of why this thing is useful for computation sensing and communication. Um, if you eventually want to link quantum computers together, you can use the existing infrastructure of optical fiber, um, right? It's kind of an unsolved problem how to make two quantum computers talk to each other in any approach except for photonics, where you can just link them by an optical fiber and, you know, get a, a, a decent, without trying too hard, a decent, uh, uh, you know, quantum coherent interconnect. Um, then there's scalability. Um, this is maybe the more subtle point. If you look at the literature recently, especially, there's been quite a, a number of leaps and bounds made in, in architectures, um, particularly multiplexed architectures for um, obtaining access to very large numbers of, of independent quantum systems. Um, especially, uh, for example, uh, you know, the work on 2D cluster states from um, DTU and, and also Kira Furosawa's group in Tokyo. Uh, they have reached something like tens of thousands to a million entangled, independently accessible entangled quantum systems. Of course, there's caveats. That's not a, a million qubit quantum computer. There's a difference there. Uh, but just the sheer scalability by either temporal multiplexing or some have also looked at frequency multiplexing um, gives you access to a, a scale that's very hard to imagine um, for sort of the more physical qubit based, uh, sorry, not physical qubit, but matter qubit based uh, approaches where a uh, qubit physically corresponds to a piece of a thing, right? It's not a, it's a kind of fermionic matter, not not bosonic matter, which can pretty easily be created, destroyed and buffered. Um, so those are kind of the, the three different ways we see photonics um, being uh, being worth the effort, because I think, you know, many would make the argument photonics is sort of behind in quantum computing, and that's true. There aren't as many qubits in these machines, but it's sort of worth it. And also, especially recently uh, with the advances in silicon photonic uh, chip fabrication uh, capabilities, that uh, that it's now ready. I think the conventional wisdom of photonics, um, you know, having really large overheads or not being able, you know, technologically to compete is no longer true. And that's for more technological reasons in the clean room. OK, so that's uh, a lot of sailing, a lot of sales. Um, let me tell you about what we actually have so you can sort of judge for yourself. Uh, this is a picture of our first uh, cloud accessible uh, quantum photonic chip. It's our, we call it our, our first uh, qu photonic quantum computer. I think it is the world's first photonic quantum hardware that's been made available for cloud access. Um, and let me expand a bit on what this chip does. Uh, it executes um, a class of algorithms which can broadly be referred to as Gaussian boson sampling. Um, so for those familiar with boson sampling, um, that was a sort of a kind of an academic architecture. Academic meaning it, it probably didn't have too many applications other than say as a way to demonstrate uh, quantum advantage or quantum supremacy at some point um, have implications you know about the church extended church touring thesis and all that I won't get into that um, I think boson sampling maybe developed a bad rap for that reason it seemed like kind of an academic exercise not something that would be a good ground or sort of uh, framework architecture to get applications embedded um, Gaussian boson sampling is an extension it's a generalization of traditional boson sampling uh, in which rather than using uh, single photons injected into a linear optical random network with single photon counting, uh, which is boson sampling, you used squeeze states, uh, squeeze states of, of, of light or whatever, whatever sort of harmonic modes you have access to, uh, programmable linear optical interferometer, so not necessarily randomized, but programmable, so you can load actual user information into it. And then instead of uh, single photon detection, photon number resolving detection. So it's sort of uh, leveling up each aspect of a boson sampler to, to kind of extend it and generalize it. So the formula is squeeze states, um, linear optics, and photon counting. And again, there's some caveats here. It's, it's squeeze states there. You know, not all squeeze states are created equal. Um, the typical ones from a, you know, a sensing experiment are not appropriate for, for the kind of uh, application. So I'll tell you, especially in the, in the final part of my talk, um, last few slides about some of the uh, 
advances we've had to make in, in getting squeeze states that are appropriate for this, in particular single temporal mode squeeze states. Um, linear optics needs to be programmable, as I mentioned, phase stable. That's led us to put things on a chip where you don't have to worry about actively locking all of these various phases that are in this network. And the monolithic chip uh, really gives you the passive intrinsic stability that uh, simplifies simplifies the system considerably. And then photon counting not being your not being your traditional photon counting with SNSPDs or APDs, but really needing photon number resolving detectors, and that's led us to use uh, transition edge sensors, which are uh, really offer fantastic photon number resolution, true photon number resolution. Zach, I saw a raised hand. Sure, I'll go for it, yeah. Yeah, it's Yves Rubel-Lozier speaking. Uh, I'm a professor in electrical engineering here in Sherbrooke. Um, could you just give a few words about what fo the boson, boson photon sampling is? Boson sampling, sorry. The traditional boson sampling. Yeah, just, just maybe not all of us are aware of that. So sure. I'd just like to understand a little bit since this is the basis of what you're doing. Yeah, so tr traditional boson sampling um, was originally introduced by um, a pair of theorists, um, Arkhipov and and, uh, and Aronson. Forget the year, but it's something like must have been about a decade or, or so, something like that uh, ago. Um, it was introduced as a way of uh, sort of a near term way of doing something that uh, with photonic hardware that uh, no classical computer could simulate. Um, and to get technical, it was about preparing. If you could prepare a lot of single photons, just individual photons, and interfere them together in a randomized um, network of beam splitters and phase shifters, so this interferometer, random interferometer, and then at the end, um, uh, detect whether or not you have a click in each of the output, uh, output modes, output detectors. Um, it turns out that that samples from a probability distribution, the output click pattern, sample from a probability distribution that is related to the permanent which is a mathematical function of a matrix that encodes the interferometer settings. And it turns out there are various sort of computer science complexity theory arguments to show that uh, that, that same task uh, attempted by a classical computer scales exponentially. So um, you, you couldn't do it in any reasonable size, um, you know, after about 50 to 100 photons or something like that. And similar number of modes, you could no longer simulate that classically with any reasonable classical computer. And so it was a way of just sort of maybe a near-term experiment that wasn't a full-blown quantum computer, but could still show some sort of, uh, you know, demonstration that a quantum device has a, has a, has a, has an advantage over classical hardware at doing something. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of experiments around this with various photons. I think probably Genway Pan's group in, in, uh, in China would be the leaders in, in boson sampling itself. Um, and again, so that maybe got garnered interest for the abstract and academic view of quantum computing and, and quantum supremacy as a sort of uh, refutation or, or addressing kind of basic questions in computer science and classical simulability, but didn't have a lot of applications that you could fit in that. You're talking about randomized phases, you're talking about a functional matrix functional that probably didn't relate to anything in the real world that was particularly useful, the matrix permanent. Um, uh, so uh, so I think, you know, maybe got a bad reputation, but Gaussian boson sampling, where you've sort of upgraded the various modules of this and generalized them, it turns out, as I will tell you, um, does uh, allow and, and allow the encoding of actual useful problems. Um, did that uh, answer your question? Any anything based on that? Yeah. Okay. Cool. I give me a sh short introduction. Yeah, that's fine. Cool. Um, so yeah, that's that's the sort of uh, what the sort of chip looks like at an abstract layer. And this is what we've built and, and identified as a as a good near term thing that we can actually build and put on the cloud. Um, so that's what the chip looks like. It has a whole bunch of different modules. Um, at an abstract level, its job is to take a classical resource, which is a train of classical coherent state laser pulses, and via this black box, which incorporates squeezed light sources and programmable interferometer, turn that into a programmable multi-mode entangled state based on the user's instructions, which are a quantum program compiled and loaded into the chip via setting a bunch of analog voltages across the various electronic phase shifters. And then at the output, um, it's uh, the it, each of the modes is directed to a uh, to the photon number resolving detectors. Um, I should mention you might see that there's only four. Um, actually, each of these uh, blocks uh, produces a two mode squeeze state, um, and so you actually do have access to an eight mode uh, space, although slightly restricted by the fact that you do have some fixed entanglement at the beginning. I'll, I'll talk more about this uh, in a in a shortly when I show you the um, the actual quantum circuit representation of this of this chip. 
So that's what it looks like. Uh, actually, there it is right there. Uh, so this is a 3D rendering of the chip itself. If light comes in on optical fibers, it leaves on optical fibers. It's fully packaged solid state. There's no moving parts. There's no alignment. Everything is like a, like a chip, like you would expect. Um, as I mentioned, there's a few different modules. You've got a coherent pup power distribution. You've got a layer of squeezers. These are resonators that produce squeeze states. Um, and this was really our invention. I think it's ended. We came to the scene before on chip an integrated squeeze light source had really been developed in a way that's appropriate for what we needed uh, to do this. Um, so we had to pour a lot of our first kind of year and a half was really about developing integrated sources of squeeze light, which I'll tell you more about. Some classical housekeeping, filtering some of the bright pump light, removing it from the bottom light, and then this programmable interferometer. So in terms of the mathematical representation, the quantum circuit that this chip executes, this is a, a representation of it. You can see that there's eight modes in total. Um, they're all squeezed. They start in vacuum, then they each undergo a squeezing gate, uh, and then they undergo a fixed 50-50 a beam splitter. And that effectively um, puts each of these outputs at this level in a two-mode squeeze state. So you have these four two-mode squeeze state pairs. And those, those two modes in those two-mode squeeze state are actually different colors. They're different wavelengths of light. So we're taking advantage of some frequency multiplexing to boost the number of modes at the cost of having some restrictions, because once you generate that entanglement, you can't really alter it with this architecture. So you have this sort of eight, uh, eight modes, four pair, which are consist of four pairs of entangled uh, two-mode squeeze states. And then you have a programmable four-mode uh, interferometer, linear optical interferometer that's applied to each of these two um, wavelength subspaces. So in total, it's sort of a, you think of this as a restricted uh, eight-mode, um, you know, Gaussian state synthesizer. And then uh, you do photon number resolving detection on each of these eight outputs. So this is the, that's the mathematical representation in terms of a gate, a gate diagram. This is very much kind of a, a, a particular class of gate model quantum computers. Um, each of these wires doesn't correspond to a qubit, but corresponds to a Q-mode, a full harmonic oscillator mode. Those familiar with CV quantum computation would, would recognize this kind of representation as a CV quantum circuit in the gate model. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so to operate this chip, um, we've had to develop a whole bunch of other stuff to operate it in particular in an automated way. Um, so it's one thing to have this chip, you know, on an alignment stage with some lasers and, you know, turning things and knobs in the lab to get it to work, which is how most experiments um, operate, uh, which is totally fair uh, if you're just trying to do an experiment, um, do some science. But if we want to make this system available to users in the middle of the night on the other side of the world uh, by a cloud access, then we need to fully automate it so that it has no human intervention for, you know, days at a time or, you know, weeks or even months at a time. Um, and so we did that. Uh, that took a lot of um, you know, engineering. Uh, we had to develop a control system, which, uh, yeah, essentially automates every function of the system. So automates the pump source, uh, stabilizes it, automates the translation of the user's instructions, which are programmed in a high-level programming language, Strawberry Fields. I'll tell you a bit more about our software. You write a quantum circuit in Strawberry Fields, kind of a Python language, and have that compiled and then actuating all the various, you know, uh, parts in the, uh, in the full hardware stack. Um, those instructions are compiled, sent, and addressed as analog voltages, as I mentioned, that are automatically set on the chip with the sort of laser pump constantly feeding the bright laser pulses into the chip. Uh, the squeezers have to be locked and, uh, and, and sort of uh, and set as well in an autonomous way. And then the whole cryogenic environment and the photon number resolving detectors, which are fairly complicated um, sort of low temperature superconducting systems themselves involving squids, involving uh, biased transition edge sensors, right, which are which are superconducting uh, uh, sort of wires. Um, that all needs to be operated, and the data acquired and discriminated turned into you know taking microvolt level uh, pulses or 100 microvolt level uh, uh, voltage traces coming out of here and turning them into um, uh, discriminating them into photon number. So that entire system uh, actually fits into one rack except for the detectors. So at this, this, this picture on the right here shows you what our, foot, our quantum computer looks like. As you can see, it's very kind of almost boring, benign, all rack mounted, the, uh, these sort of eight black fibers coming out at the bottom. Those are going to the cross step where we have our, our photon number resolving detectors, but everything else is just all room temperature sitting in a very benign kind of data center system. Um, I should mention also that the type of cryostat involved here is not, um, in this particular one, it's not a dilution bridge. Um, you don't need a dilution fridge. You don't need to go down to five millikelvin. It's anything below around 100 millikelvin is fine. And so we can actually use a different type of cryostat that's uh, a bit more benign than a dil fridge, which is very nice. So that's kind of a high-level diagram of how the system works. Okay, so results. Um, you know, we've we used the system and tried to characterize it. Um, of course, there's a lot you can do. There's a very large space of problems. Um, here are some uh, some data on on sort of 
basic benchmarks of the individual performance of the squeezers uh, and the and the linear optics. So circuit level kind of a component level characterization of the different of the different uh, functionalities by dialing in specific simple circuits. Um, so this one is dialing in, I guess, the simplest circuit. Just turn on one of these squeezers to make a two mode squeeze state. So you have a squeezer pair producing entangled two mode squeezing, and then just measure in the photon basis what that two mode squeeze state looks like. Um, and you can see, for example, you look at the correlations, the NRF is the variance of the number difference. It's the noise reduction factor. It's a measure of non-classicality and entanglement. Anything below one indicates an entangled state. So you can see very, very clearly that we've got uh, clearly resolvable entanglement um, uh, at each at, at the outputs of, of each of these squeezer pairs. Uh, another important feature is the uh, degree of uh, the second order correlation function G2. That tells you um, whether all of your squeezing is, is being uh, synthesized in uh, one particular uh, squeezed uh, pair of modes. And you can see that that is the case. That's quite close to two. Noise corrected actually is all about 1.9. Um, so there's a little bit of population in an unwanted mode. Um, so we dialed in that. Then we also checked crucially that you can turn on two of these squeezers and interfere them. So we looked at the uh, various, uh, this sort of at a noise reduction factor, this, this measure of entanglement and non-classicality as a function of the relative phase uh, between two of these squeezer pairs as you turn them both on and then ramp that phase and then measure uh, across four modes in the FOC basis, in the photon basis. And you can see there's very pronounced uh, pronounced uh, oscillations that fit the theory quite well, showing that you can indeed you know, take two of our Q modes and in the FOC basis interfere them. This is highly multi-photon interference buried in these interference branches. It's a, Kind of a lot to describe in the amount of time, but um, this stuff is, uh, is sort of a manuscript that's been submitted. So hopefully this will this will be uh, available more publicly soon, and, and you can have a, a deeper look if you're if you're interested. Okay, so that was kind of the, the system. That was the um, component level characterization. Uh, I've been talking and promising about applications, so let me talk a bit about those. Um, Gaussian boson sampling, uh, a lot of the work at Xanadu um, and in other groups, but especially at Xanadu, on the algorithm side is focused in the past couple of years on what problems can be mapped into a Gaussian boson sampler. Uh, it turns out that there is a, uh, a duality about Gaussian uh, or, a, or a, a very clear one-to-one um, -one correspondence between the types of circuits that can be loaded in a Gaussian boson sampling chip and graph structured data. Uh, graph structured meaning a, data that's represented as uh, points, nodes with edges uh, connecting them, like you can see here in this, in this panel. Um, it turns out if you have data that can be represented as a graph with weighted edges, you can represent it as an adjacency matrix, a matrix, and then you can take that adjacency matrix and decompose it in such a way that you can be uh, directly mapped into the settings of the squeezers and the phases and beam splitting ratios on that chip. And by sampling the photo, uh, in the photon number basis, uh, the um, by sampling in the photon number basis, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the looking at the click patterns essentially of, of you know the squeeze light that's gone through this encoded matrix in the linear optical interferometer, you can learn some interesting features about that graph. In particular, uh, the most probable click patterns are actually correspond directly to the densest subgraphs, the most tightly connected subgraphs in in that uh, in that system. In fact, the most probable um, click pattern directly corresponds to the max click, the most maximally collected uh, connected. Um, subset of, of points in a, in a graph. Uh, you can also encode two different graphs in uh, which might be sort of um, uh, equivalent isomorphic in the sense that they're just a permutation of each other of their vertices. And you can try to tell whether or not that's the case. So you can encode uh, and say the similarity between two different graphs by encoding the, their ma respective matrices into the chip and, and look at whether or not they're, they're um, sort of isomorphic or not. It turns out that two graphs are um, isomorphic if and only if their Gaussian boson sampling click patterns are identical. Um, so that's an interesting uh, application space. Also, you can encode the, vibro the vibronic, um, certain uh, vibrational transitions of molecules uh, can be encoded uh, in a Gaussian boson sampler. And you can look and try to sample from the vibronic spectrum, which is associated with sort of the optical spectrum that's associated when a, uh, with a, uh, a structural change in a molecule to the vibrational modes when it undergoes an electronic transition. Um, so that can also be studied um, using a Gaussian boson sampler. That, that work actually was not standard. That came out of, um, I believe, Harvard, uh, Alanis Berkusik's group and Jitsuk group. And there's a couple others, but um, I'll sort of focus on these. Uh, if you're interested, by the way, in any more of these, we've got a nice paper from, from my algorithm and software colleagues, um, Applications of Near-Term Photonic Quantum Computers, where they really go through each of these um, and talk about how to study them, how that decomposition and mapping works, and also how to, uh, how to encode them in, in our software strawberry fields. So you can have a look at that paper. 
which was just out uh, earlier this year. OK, so um, data from, from a few uh, very basic demos of these apps. Um, graph similarity, what we've done here is encoded uh, a sort of a few different types of fully kind of bipartite, fully connected graphs and looked at um, sort of uh, different classes among themselves, which are isomorphic and not isomorphic. So this cluster, this is uh, a cluster of points that uh, corresponds to a bunch of different permutations of, um, uh, of, of this graph uh, in which you have uh, three uh, negative weighted edges. Um, this class of points, this is a class of graphs in which you permuted the vertices, but you've still kept the feature where only one um, edge is uh, is negatively weighted. Uh, same thing here, two edges are negatively weighted. So each of these clusters of points are click pattern probabilities, and you can see that they've clustered very, very nicely um, amongst themselves. They're just permutations, but they've kept the same structure. That structure being that, that that structural feature being how many negatively weighted edges do you have? And you can see there's very clear separation between these different classes. And here you can see what the identity looks like. That's just corresponds to um, just pairs of points that aren't really connected at all. So you see this really, really nice clustering and really, really robust and significant separation. So you can kind of run these toy model uh, graph similarity problems already on this hardware. Um, we've also had a look at a sort of a toy molecule problem to see how that uh, fleshes out uh, in, in experimental data. And you can see experimental theory very nicely align in terms of, uh, in terms of the vibrational uh, vibronic spectrum demo. And then to characterize maybe more um, in a less biased way, right? You can always worry that you're cooking up a particular unitary that makes things look nice. Uh, we've done sort of more just randomized Gaussian boson sampling. And these four panels here are just um, a bunch of different uh, random um, sort of random unitaries. Um, and you can look at the click patterns that we get from the experiment and what you predict from a theoretical model that takes into account the system and some of its imperfections to show that yeah, we kind of understand. The agreement is good enough to say that we, we understand what's going on. Um, we understand what the system's doing and our theoretical modeling of the system does reflect reality. So very important to kind of do some randomized studies as well. Cool, as I mentioned, this manuscript is uh, currently in, in review. So hopefully um, in the next little while, it'll be uh, available to, uh, to be assessed uh, and you can read, re read up on, on the archive, uh, hopefully pretty soon. Okay, so that uh, that brings me, that's kind of the end of the, of the discussion I've got on um, on our cloud accessible system and our uh, Gaussian boson sampling over the cloud. For those who are interested more in the in the technology, in the photonic technology, uh, I'll now for the next few slides uh, to conclude, I'll uh, I'll talk about um, nanophotonic sources of squeezed light. So uh, I think when we uh, came onto the scene, um, you know, around 2017, say when we really started getting serious about building the hardware. Uh, we wanted to do something with, uh, you know, integrated continuous variable quantum information processing circuits. But what was really lacking um, was the uh, a, a, a suitable squeezed light source. So, you know, there's been a lot done in integrating linear optics and interferometers. That's all good. Um, uh, our collaboration with NIST gave us great photon number resolving detectors. But uh, as a squeezed light source, uh, there are a bunch of features that really made uh, the existing state of the art. Um, not really of, in terms of chip integrated uh, platforms, chip integrated squeezers, not appropriate. Uh, so when people think, uh, I'll, I'll put a few sort of examples here. These two columns of kind of what was available at the time. So there was uh, low confinement um, systems like uh, periodically pulled lithium niobate. Um, that'd be maybe the, the dominant one for chips. Um, and low confinement meaning the index contrast between the waveguide and the cladding is quite low. So these are actually quite large waveguides. You can't really make um, highly densely integrated circuits with them because they're pretty big. You can't really bend. You can't make resonators very easily. So it's not a nanophotonic system, so not really scalable. On the other points, it was fine. You want quadrature squeezing. It could be made photon county compatible and so on. Um, but uh, but that was really an exclusion. We wanted something that could scale to the thousands of components eventually when we scale these systems up. And and the, the kind of the, the the status quo in Piplin was, was not appropriate. Um, a good example of this, it, it's still good for other applications, of course. A good example of this would be uh, Mikro Lovina's work um, a couple of years ago, where they showed integration of two of these sources and sort of linear optics, homodine detection, um, you know, mixing low gloss later on the chip, very nice and great. It's just, you know, this chip is something like the size of my hand. It's, you know, six centimeters long or something like that. And, and so it's not really appropriate for you know, scaling to thousands of components. Um, in terms of nanophotonic systems, for on chip squeezers, what was available uh, were these above threshold OPOs. Uh, driving a silicon nitride micro ring above threshold and looking at intensity different squeezing. So that was an anaphotonic squeezer, um, probably useful for sensing, um, but not useful for kind of quantum computation applications because 
you couldn't get quadrature squeezing, right? You just have this intensity difference squeezing above threshold. Um, uh, it was very bright squeezing, so so quite large, you know, coherent carriers in the squeeze modes, meaning you couldn't make that photon count incompatible. You just, you know, you burn up any kind of photon, single photon detector or photon number resolving detector. Um, couldn't be made single temporal mode. The dynamics of above threshold OPOs is just too complicated, and lots of excess noise because again, you're above threshold, so the pumps start to mix into this into the uh, into the into the, the generated quadratures of the signal and the. So we had to develop something new, you know, which was a uh, something that could hopefully tick off all these boxes. We wanted nanophotonic. We wanted it to show quadrature squeezing, something that we could measure with photon counting, uh, right? Not just homodyne detection. Um, it needed to be single temporal mode. Uh, it's not widely appreciated, but if you want to do multi-photon detection um, on a squeeze state, you really have to have that in a single well-defined pulsed mode. You can't use CW squeezing and you can't use multi-mode um, pulsed squeezing. You have to have a single temporal mode squeezing populating only one Schmidt mode. Um, and of course, we don't want any excess noise because we are measuring a, you know, a large bucket of frequencies. Right? We don't have the exquisite frequency selectivity that homodyne gives you if you're doing photon counting. You're measuring a whole 100 gigahertz wide window of say a WDM channel. And so we really needed to have that very low noise. So that led us to use um, kind of adaptive state of the art, which is silicon nitride still. Uh, it's a great choice of platform and look at micro rings but study their below threshold behavior. And so I'll tell you about some of the experiments that we did um, uh, to sort of uh, characterize the squeezing in these micro ring devices. So as I said, it's a silicon nitride ring resonator. Um, it's side coupled, hard to see in this image, but it's side coupled to a channel waveguide. There's a little bit of evanescent coupling between the modes of the of the bus waveguide and the res and the ring resonator itself, um, and what we used uh, exploited is the third order nonlinear optical response, the chi three of the material of the silicon nitride out of which the resonator is made itself, uh, and we used three resonances of the of the resonator, uh, a pump signal and idler, and if you want to know what the Hamiltonian looks like for this interaction, which is called spontaneous Fourier mixing, you uh, essentially take two photons from the pump and you create a photon pair in the signal and the idler. Um, that can be used just to generate single you know, photon pairs or heralded single photons. Uh, but if you pump hard enough, you know, of course, you're going to get multi-pair emission, and that gives you a two-mode squeeze state between the signal and the idler. So we, we did that. We pumped uh, at the pump, and we generated the sort of two-mode squeeze state at the signal and the idler. Um, so this is what you'd call non-degenerate uh, or two-mode squeezing uh, in two different wavelengths, bichromatic squeezing. Another way to think of it is that you have two squeeze modes, uh, both of which having frequency support at the signal and the idler. So you have these hybrid modes where you have a symmetric and anti-symmetric co linear combination of signal idlers so or red and blue or red minus blue. And then you have two squeeze states um, at, at that kind of composite bichromatic, uh, bichromatic mode. Um, so we wanted to measure the quadrature squeezing. So starting with homodyne detection, which is sort of the canonical and you know, way to, to really assess um, a, squeezed, uh, a, squeeze, uh, a squeeze light source. Uh, and the hard part of this experiment was generating a phase locked local oscillator between uh, the signal, the idler, and the pump. Because if you want to do coherent detection, homodyne detection, you've got to make sure that your local oscillator beams are, um, at, which are now in two different colors uh, compared to the pump. Uh, so we've got three wavelengths in the game. You've got to make sure those are phase stable. So we had to do a bunch of sort of uh, locking, um, phase lock loops. Uh, but once you've got the pump worked out, the experiment actually was fairly straightforward. You inject the pump, circulate, we had to lock the resonator. No big deal. Separate out the signal and the idler, and then combine it with a single homodyne detection, uh, homodyne detector with a local oscillator that has frequency support at this at the two colors at the signal and idler wavelengths. So what, what's called a bichromatic local oscillator. It's really no different than a monochromatic local oscillator. You just think of the mode that you're measuring, which is determined by the LO. The mode that you're measuring now just has frequency support at both red and blue or signal and idler wavelengths. So we did that and we uh, looked at the usual quadrature squeezing, squeezing and anti-squeezing, got very nice results. And we showed the power scaling looks exactly as we sort of expect. Uh, crucially, um, uh, you know, we didn't really see any signatures of excess noise um, beyond just what you'd expect from having a squeeze state subject to loss. Uh, we measured uh, at the end, you know, 1 dB directly measured. Uh, of course, it's quite difficult to back up what the squeezing was on chip before the losses. And I think at that point we were able to say there's about five, three, between three and five dB on chip. Pretty big margin of error there, but safe to say between three and five. Um, that uh, that should be it's actually it's on the archive here. That's an older version um, that will be out on Friday in Science Advances. Actually, uh, so keep, you can keep an eye out there if you want to read about uh, all this, or just look at the archive. Although we'll, we should put out a uh, an updated uh, updated result there on the archive soon as soon as it's published. Um, so that was quadrature 
measurements, sort of verifying that everything looked kosher from the perspective of uh, looking at, you know, quadrature squeezing and anti-squeezing. Uh, but we do want to verify also that we can do photon counting on the system. Um, and so we did that. We uh, used our uh, photon number resolving detectors, which we are very grateful to uh, enjoy based on a collaboration with NIST, the group of Sewunam at NIST Boulder. These are magical detectors. Not, probably don't have enough time to talk, uh, to sing their praises enough. They're a beautiful, wonderful system to work with. On the right here, I've shown um, uh, a set of uh, sample traces from what you actually see on the oscilloscope when you put light, uh, pulsed light on these detectors. Um, this, the, each individual, you see how this sort of each of these, this is for two different channels. So just look at the green traces, say, um, each of these uh, sort of clustered set of traces corresponds to a different photon number. So you can see the kind of vacuum, and then you have the one photon, the two photon, three photon, four, five, six, seven, even up to eight or nine photons, clearly resolvable. Um, and so we did photon number resolving detection of these pulsed squeeze modes um, by pulsing um, the pump and looked at some of these uh, quantum features. I told you about the noise reduction factor. That's, that's this, the variance of the number difference um, as a function of the mean. And if that's below what it should be for a coherent state, you can say that it's entangled between the two modes, um, or non-classical. Um, so we did that. We built a pulsed experiment where we pulsed the pump and looked at, took each of the signal annihilator, put it on its own transition assessor, and we uh, looked at the noise reduction factor. That's in this inset here. You can see for coherent states, you get exactly as you predict, one classical, but then the squeeze states are well below that. Uh, we actually measured um, uh, 1.5 dB of different squeezing, um, but uh, we can infer on the chip actually that 7 dB of correlations of that type of squeezing was present on the chip. Um, there, that's limited on the chip, not by gain, but just by loss because photons are always created in pairs. So an ideal lossless, noiseless two-mode squeeze state uh, would always give you um, sort of a noise reduction factor of zero, right? Because the variance of the number difference should be zero. But of course we had some loss. So um, off chip 0.7, 1.5 dB, on chip about 7 dB. So I think that was a, a pretty good um, a demonstration that uh, we're quite happy with showing that that squeeze light source could, you know, satisfy the needs of the kind of circuit that, uh, that we've now made available on the cloud. Um, finally, as I mentioned, I talked a lot about temper mode structure there. Uh, we look at the G2. Um, ideally, you want a G2 at 2. That indicates um, that for each half of the two-mode squeeze state that you've got a thermal state, a single-mode thermal state. And it's crucial that you have a single-mode thermal state because if you have a multi-mode thermal state, um, then you've got, you know, you're kind of playing a game of whose mode is it anyway. Photons are populating many, many mode pairs, and you won't get the statistics you want um, from, a, from a programmable system. So um, we actually have, I would say, among the best in the literature of any squeeze, pulsed squeeze light source in terms of the temporal mode structure, noise corrected, we've got a G2 of 1.9, which um, is a Schmidt number of like, uh, yeah, I don't know, 1.08 or something like that. Um, so you can see flying very, 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 very close to two. And that's really um, in order, you know, the dynamics that need to build that are, are related to making sure that your pump pulses are comparable or shorter to the dwelling time of the uh, of the modes, the squeeze modes in the resonator. So very happy about that. Actually, since then we've even got a bit better, a uh, bit better results above uh, above 1.9. So I'll just finish up by talking about degenerate squeezing. So the, the squeezers that I mentioned, and this is related to, were, were non degenerate, and that actually is related to that two mode restriction. The reason that those squeezers, those squeeze modes, were generated in fixed pairs of two mode entangled states was because um, we had this chromatic entanglement from the non degenerate nature of the squeezers. In the future, of course, we want to have degenerate squeezing. And uh, there's a whole bunch of other things you have to worry about there um, with degenerate squeezing. Um, if you're using uh, four-wave mixing, you'll use two pumps, and those, those will generate a photon pair in the center wavelength. So degenerate squeezing is a nice single mode. Uh, but then, if you, because you have two pumps, you have many, many more interactions. You've got this whole zoology of terms that you have to worry about. So um, I won't go into too much detail here. Again, you can look at the archive. Uh, a paper, we get a quick write-up on it, uh, it's still sort of active active work that we're doing. Uh, but the answer to that is make what's called a photonic molecule. So take two resonators and use some of the resonances of the auxiliary resonator, the top resonator here, to selectively su suppress some of the resonant processes that you don't want to happen, um, about while preserving the resonant process that you do want to happen, namely the one that gives you two mode squeezing. Um, so we did this, uh, and we've got very, very nice uh, squeezing uh, almost 2 dB measured, uh, but actually on chip, uh, we can infer that we have about 8 dB of squeezing um, uh, on the chip, which is the largest amount of squeezing of any kind on any nanophotonic platform, uh, which we're quite proud of. Uh, the experiment there is a little more complicated because you now have to worry about getting uh, two pumps. Um, they have to be, again, phase locked to your, to your 
uh, to your local oscillator, which is now a single frequency, um, and you got to get enough power in them and so on. So we had to kind of come up with a, uh, a nonlinear way of locking all these different uh, themes together. But ultimately, it was successful. Again, you can read a bit about this um, on the archive, and we'll have more an expanded version coming out soon. Uh, cool. I think that's it for. Yeah, I think that's it for the technical parts. Um, I'll just finish up by mentioning I've talked a lot about uh, the hardware. A very big part of our company, though, is not just hardware, but software. Uh, we have two offerings there. Penny Lane, which is really the uh, sort of the premier quantum machine learning library. Uh, it connects not only to our hardware, it's sort of hardware agnostic. It's meant to do quantum machine learning on uh, all sorts of other hardware platforms. So it's connected to IBM or Getty, of course, our hardware too. Um, it's sort of, you can think of it as the PyTorch or the TensorFlow of, of quantum machine learning. Um, and then Strawberry Fields. Strawberry Fields is a photonic, is a platform for programming photonic quantum computers, um, continuous variable photonic quantum computers. Uh, so you can either use the simulator um, to, to simulate your quantum circuits, or it's also the way that you write scripts to actually be loaded on our quantum hardware. Both of these are open source, freely available, so uh, you can check these out uh, on, on our websites and, uh, and have a look if you're interested in photonic quantum computing or if you're interested in quantum machine learning. I think um, Penny Lane is definitely being taken up as uh, one of the sort of dominant uh, tools in the quantum software space. I think uh, that's a good point to call it. Um, so I'll leave you with a nice image of what uh, what it looks like. The view this is the view out from our lab um, overlooking the sort of uh, western side of Toronto. You can see the provincial legislature, Ontario legislature there at Queen's Park. The University of Toronto here in the background, that's the Department of Physics um, with the two little green domes on top. So really, really nice place to work. An unusual setting, I think, for an optics lab up there. Of course, we have uh, blackout shutters that come down if we need it to be dark. But um, yeah, happy to take any questions. Thanks very much for uh, for your attention. Thanks, Zach. That's a, quite a nice office you have there. <laughs> right, I'll let Julien ask his question. Yeah, thank you very much for your very uh, for this very good talk. Um, the first question is uh, very technical, so um, it seems like you're losing a lot of the uh, the, the, the squeezing uh, due to the fact that you had the readout at low temperature. So what's the workaround for this? Um, uh, do you do you envision of bringing the chip down to low temperature to avoid the the losses through the cables, or um, bringing the readout uh, level uh, up to room temperature? Does this also seem feasible? It's a good question. Um, yeah, so right now it's interesting because the, 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 the transition edge sensors, the photon resolving detectors themselves are actually extremely um, high quantum efficiency. So there are 90, over 95% um, of the photons incident on them. So once you have a photon in a fiber, there's a 95% chance that it will be detected by the sensor and not lost. So that, that efficiency is actually not the bottleneck. Um, the bottleneck and nor is the propagation loss in the fiber. This is telecom, so you know fiber losses are negligible. You know, kilometers of fiber would only give you, a, you know, a dB of loss or something like that, 0.2 dB per kilometer. So really nothing there. It's the the losses um, that we suffer by having off chip detection are the losses associated with going from the chip into the fiber. Um, so it's true that we could think of a, a you know monolithic solution where the sensors are integrated right into the waveguides, um, but we really want to keep as much as possible at room temperature. So I would say we're more interested in the direction of trying to improve the interconnect loss. So trying to make couplers from chips to fibers much, much better than they currently are. Right now we get between one and two dB loss, um, right? So something like 80, 80, you know, 20 or 30 percent of the light lost at that stage. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we, you know, we have demonstrated in our lab 0.5 on a kind of a one off basis. And I think um, talking with a lot of other packaging partners that we could probably try to get larger rays of these things eventually with sub 0.5 dB, maybe 0 0.1, 0 0.2 dB outcoupling loss and there you're managing to keep you know well over 90 percent of your light um, even as it exits the chip and goes into the cryostat so i would say to answer your question it's not so much of putting the chip in the cryostat but more developing extremely low loss interconnects from chip to fiber did that... right, did any... oh, sorry zach did anyone else have a question all right shall go ahead uh, yes, I'd have a question more about the single temporal mode in the the detection. Mm -hmm. If it, if it's still a nomodyne detection, uh, how do you maintain the phase relation between the two? Ah, yeah. So for single temporal mode um, measurements, uh, it's not uh, homodyne detection. Okay. Uh, so for the single temporal mode, we pulse, and um, these are sort of 
roughly nanosecond bandwidth, um, nanosecond duration, so gigahertz bandwidth squeeze temporal modes. Uh, probably not impossible to do home but detection, but quite difficult. So we actually, to assess the temporal mode structure, we look in the FOC basis, and there's some very good theory for Gaussian states about how to infer um, the temporal, the Schmidt number, the number of temporal modes present and populated based on those photon statistics. So we don't have okay. to worry about phase stability too much for the um, for the for the FOC basis measurements. All right, thank you. All right, anyone else? Yeah, Julien again. Yes, uh, another question. So you mentioned at the beginning of your talk that the uh, Gaussian boson sampling was uh, like a hard problem in a, a classical computer. So how large would your chip size need to be to achieve something which is similar um, to what has been demonstrated by Google for quantum supremacy? Yeah, it's a good question as well. Um, I'd say it's still something of an open question, you know, constantly with both boson sampling and Gaussian boson sampling, they're trying to push the frontier of, you know, making classical computers simulate larger and larger systems. I'd say it's a similar number of, of qubits as you need um, for quantum supremacy um, or boson sampling. So between 50 and 100 roughly modes um, and, and photons. Uh, so, you know, I showed you an eight mode chip we actually have in our lab um, much larger. We have uh, we have 24 mode chips uh, and we're doubling uh, every six months to a year. So I think um, between 50 and 100 is the answer and hopefully we'll be there in the next couple of years. All right, maybe I had a question regarding that. So what what pushed you to choose eight modes for your first chip? Is it just was it just technical, you know, considerations or? Yeah, it seemed reasonable, um, kind of as big as we were comfortable going on the first iteration. As I mentioned, we, you know, the architecture scales quite well. So we've, we have in our lab, you know, chips that have 24 modes on them. They, as they get larger, um, one of the big issues is electronic packaging, because you have a lot of electrical signals going in and out. Similar problem to the superconducting world, right? So you have to worry about how to get all those signals in and out uh, in a way that also respects the ability for the optical fibers to go in and out and then as you add more output channels, you have to worry as these fiber gets fiber arrays get bigger, you might not get as good a coupling efficiency on all the different outputs. So it's kind of a packaging issue, I would say, more than anything else. All right, thanks. Shal, did you have another question or? Uh, no, it's fine for me. Okay. All right. So anyone else? All right. If not, then we'll just. Okay. Oh, Julien, okay. <laughs> yeah, I could, have, I could have had another one. So okay, the other one is, was about the uh, Vibronic Spectra uh, simulation. I would just uh, try to, so I'm not uh, very used to um, how to simulate systems with the uh, photonic system and try to get a, a sense of how does this compare to uh, uh, CI calculation that has been done on the IBM machine, for instance, or the, the Google one. Uh, so how many how many modes do you need to simulate, let's say, a, a, a a molecule of a certain size, does it scale the same way as what you would need for uh, for uh, regular, I would say, a qubit-based uh, qubit based simulation? Yep, no, good question. I'm not an expert in this. I believe because the mapping is very direct between the structure, I mean, the, the, the vibrational modes of a molecule are harmonic oscillators. So in some sense, you're mapping every bond, every vibrational mode of, the, of a molecule to one mode of the chip. So I think there's a, a roughly a one-to-one -one correspondence in terms of the number of vibrational modes that are involved in your molecule, which is related to the molecule size, um, to the actual number of modes that you need on your chip, roughly one-to-one. -one. Okay, I have, to remember, I, guess... I have to remember here that it's sort of an analog quantum simulation. So you're not sort of encoding um, a complicated system in a bunch of binary registers like you are with qubit-based simulators. Here you're encoding an entire mode in an entire mode. So it's kind of, kind, of, kind of like, almost like a quantum, like a like a scale model kind of simulation, right? Where you're trying to emulate the dynamics of something in a programmable, reconfigurable system. Yeah, I guess there's some similarities there because for for, uh, for a qubit-based architecture, the simulation is done by encoding uh, also every, um, every orbital, let's say, into mm -hmm. one of the qubits. Um, and then the precision is acquired by having more and more orbitals, of course. But in your case, you gain because the like the size of the circuit you need to implement for a given size molecule is always the same. Uh, it's just through these SU4 uh, uh, calculation, I would say. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think the 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 battle there is getting the fidelity high enough by driving down the imperfections, especially optical loss, 
um, I think getting that down to be low. Another thing I, to, to make full use of vibronic spectrum, um, you do need uh, uh, displacements, so not just squeezing, but coherent displacements. So not just squeezing a mode in phase space, but moving it around. Um, that should be easy in a sense that it's classical. Um, all you have to do is seed the squeezers or or you know mix them on a beam splitter with a bit of coherent light, coherent states, classical light. In practice, getting everything worked out with uh, you know phase coherent and also getting the temporal modes that the coherent states and the squeeze states populate to be exactly the same as the jobs. So we're working on that. But I'd say there's um, more bottlenecks right now than just, or more things, hurdles to get over than just the sort of number of modes that we have available. All right, thank you very much, Zach, for the discussion and the great talk. Um, I think we're out of questions. So yeah, thank you again for being here with us. Thanks everyone for attending and thanks for organizing. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Zach. Have a good day, everyone. Goodbye. Right, you too. Bye. Thanks a lot.